It's 1992. Ross Perot, Bill Clinton, and President George H.W. Bush are all running for President of the United States. Microsoft just released Windows 3.1. I just turned 14 years old, and this happened. Tell me a little bit about Youngblood. You got real life with it, right? Um, yeah, it's, uh, Youngblood is a team of um, government like uh, superheroes. They, as an answer to like, nuclear weapons, they start genetically engineering these super people. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they become celebrities. More than 100 people lined up for hours outside a Hollywood, California comic book store to buy a signed copy of Youngblood, a new series created by 23-year-old artist Rob Liefeld. Hopefully, in the, by the time I retire, liquidate everything and uh, retire comfortably. Store owners say if first day demand for Youngblood is any indication of future interest, the value of the comic could double within the first week. So Youngblood number one just drops like a bomb, just changes everything. These guys form Image, Marvel stock is plummeting, DC's <laughs> killing Superman, you know, breaking Batman's back just to keep up with all this dark gritty madness that's going on. Youngblood number one best selling indie comic of all time when it, when it comes out, just changes the landscape. If you weren't there, if you didn't see it, it blew everything away. <laughs> And I know what some of you have got to be thinking, oh man, awesome, uh, finally we're, we're going to talk about some image stuff, some 90s comics. And then I'm sure others out there are thinking, no God, no God, please no, 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 no. But either way, <laughs> either way, we're going to do this. Um, I was, I've been really looking forward to this until I read it. <laughs> and, but still, like, it literally delivers everything, uh, everything I was looking for. So anyway, I'm Jason Horn. This is Long Boxer. We're digging through uh, some of my old Long Boxes, trying to find some cool newsprint comics. And boy, this is, uh, this is a comic. <laughs> but, uh, but let's rewind a little bit. So, uh, so it's 1990, and Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man number one comes out, pre-bagged with uh, with various covers. And this is my, this is for real my copy that I bought off the newsstands, uh, still bagged. <laughs> I never opened this thing. I'm sure that made it worth so much more now. So this sells over two million copies. So then. It's February of 1991, and uh, with this New Mutants 98, everyone knows the first appearance of Deadpool, but uh, with this issue, this is the first issue where Liefeld, Rob Liefeld, takes full control over New Mutants, and he decides to end the title and then relaunch it later that year with X-Force number one, which is was bagged similarly to uh, Spider-Man, bagged with five different trading cards, goes on to sell four million copies. So then later, 1991, Jim Lee, Chris, Cla Chris Claremont come out with this X-Men number one. Five different covers. <laughs> I bought two of them. Sells over 8 million copies and is still, still the Guinness World Record best-selling comic of all time. Over 8 million copies. That's, that's essentially, like, unheard of. <laughs> so, so these guys... Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee, these guys changing Marvel Comics forever. You know, getting, I'm sure they were, you know, paid well, getting some, uh, some royalties off of these amazing sales. But at the end of the day, <laughs> they didn't feel like they were getting enough. And, and honestly, they probably weren't. So, like, around this time, Marvel is getting ready to start like merchandising the X-Men like in a way that they have never done before like Spider-Man had been merchandised you know for decades but this first big push for for 
merchandising like posters, shirts, action figures, all that stuff. Of these X-Men characters, you know, based on their costume designs sometimes. And then, but like even original characters that they're creating, they're seeing none of that money. Liefeld, McFarlane, Jim Lee, they're not seeing any of the money from that stuff. And that doesn't go over well with them. <laughs> so that, that leads us to this. So like it or hate it, you know, this comic changes the industry forever. Um, <laughs> and it is, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty polarizing as, uh, as you'd imagine. And I understand why. <laughs> All the reasons that make this such a polarizing book, completely understandable. But I love it. This book, I don't know, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about it. Like, I think the reason this resonated so much with me, a 14 year old, I mean, I was 13, just turned 14. I think part of the reason that this resonated with me was because I, it's one of those things where like, you know, like kids, <laughs> kids listen to like bad music, right? Everyone says like, oh, kids these days are listening to this terrible music. And I think that's kind of like always true. So, you know, like older people always are going to think that like my parents listened to the Beatles or whatever. And that sounded, I didn't like that. Or like, you know, they're, they were listening to Elvis or whatever. And their parents hated that. I listened to Michael Jackson and Madonna. My parents didn't like that. My mom kind of liked it, but uh, she was still young. My mom had me when she was 20, so she was still pretty hip. <laughs> but, you know, kids like stupid things. But the thing, I think the thing that they like is something that's made for them. I think that's... If you look at kids today, like kids are, you know, watching stuff on YouTube, like watching people play video games that they like, and these people are just yelling and acting crazy, telling stupid jokes doing the crazy voices and it but it's you know it's hard for, <laughs> for us hard for me to understand like what what is the appeal of that ridiculousness but I feel like you know they they feel like that's made for them and this was made for me and I was super excited to get it <laughs> but did it live up to the hype at the time like the next generation of heroes I don't think so <laughs> Not these guys. If you ask me, the next generation of heroes were the guys that decided to say goodbye to Marvel and change the industry because they wanted to own their stuff. For better or for worse, whatever that stuff might be, it was a bold decision. And uh, that's what made you know this generation, my generation of creators on these books when I was growing up, that's what made this stuff so exciting, as it says here. So exciting and so, uh, so you know, industry changing eventually. So this is 27 years ago. <laughs> 27 years ago, man. That That's crazy. So if you're watching this, I mean, you probably know the story of Image Comics. But, like, <laughs> if you didn't live through it, I don't know if you understand, like, how huge it was. The impact it had on a 14-year-old kid like me. So 1992, Young Blood number one comes out in April's first book, Image Comics, best-selling indie comic of all time at this time, and then this happens. <laughs> Todd McFarlane, Spawn number one. Uh, just one month later, Spawn number one comes out. I think this. I think I'm pretty sure, man. All these numbers, but uh, this one outsells Young Blood number one. July. Savage Dragon comes out. Eric Larson, formerly of uh, Spider-Man. And then in August, you get Darker Image number one. And I'll talk a lot about the Max because out of all this stuff, you know, all this, all these books had an impact on me at the time, but most of that impact was very short-lived, except for the Max. So the month that comes out, Shadowhawk from Valentino comes out. Wildcats, one that I was really looking forward to. The two books that I was most into was Youngblood and Wildcats, because those were the artists I was most into um, from Marvel, was Liefeld and Lee. And McFarlane I liked, but I, I just hadn't really been able to track down much of his stuff at that point. 
but uh but man once i got into spawn i think spawn like rose over wildcats pretty quickly <laughs> nothing beat nothing would beat young blood though so then later brigade comes out and this is important because this is about the time <laughs> when i started to catch on like hey these dudes are just releasing crap that they're drawing to the covers for and the inside's not them at all and it's not very good maybe <laughs> just maybe um, this is like, you know, kind of a bait and switch stuff that's going on and I'm not super into it, but I'll get more into that later. So then Silvestri comes out, Cyberforce number one. These are all my copies that I had as a kid, as they came out. Um, none of this stuff, <laughs> stuff that I picked up now, I kept all this, never got rid of it. And then Supreme Supreme is another one of those where it's like, who's, this is, you know, he shows up in Youngblood. And you're like, great, Liefeld creation. You open this and you're like, this is this is not Liefeld. This is not for me. I think this is the only issue of Supreme that I picked up. Then Jim Lee's Death Blow, which, you know, that shows up real well. <laughs> but it's got this embossed foil, though. And then uh, Del Kion Pit. I was not familiar with this stuff at all. I think I've got like one Hulk comic. And I think this might be the only issue, or maybe, maybe two or three. I might have first couple of issues of pit but i didn't really keep up with that and then again <laughs> and then this is just like the onslaught of like what is this stuff that is not you know stormwatch from jim lee studio not jim lee blood strike from liefeld studio not liefeld that's when i started to realize and i think that's the only issue of stormwatch and this is the only issue of blood strike i got i was just not into it if those dudes weren't drawing it i was not into it but then this comes along <laughs> And this, I was very into. So, I talked about this on, on Twitter a little bit the other day. Like, I don't know if you realize how huge the Max was, especially once that MTV cartoon came out. Like, a lot of these dudes, you know, like I said, the impact of these books were short-lived because the dudes didn't stay with the books. Everyone complains about, you know, how late the image books got to be and obviously that's a huge problem but man the bigger problem for me was they stopped drawing the stuff and i just didn't care anymore after they stopped drawing because they would get these people you know that would draw similarly but i wasn't interested man i wanted the dudes <laughs> that i'd came there for or i wanted you know nothing at all and that's essentially that's what happened they stopped drawing those books i stopped buying them and then eventually stopped buying comics altogether except for this I kept up with the Max for years, even after I'd stopped buying anything. So like I and I love Sam Keith's work, you know, before before this even came out. Because like I said, a lot of those dudes, like like uh, you know, like the Dale Keown, I I wasn't super familiar, but like Sam Keith, <laughs> I was already super into his stuff, like just just great stuff. It's just super interesting like honestly like i was thinking today also like along i was saying how huge that the max cartoon was but like also just liquid tv in general was so huge for me i think like it had i think it really impacted my decision i think to even go to art school like once i saw all that stuff if you're not familiar like so liquid tv um liquid television on mtv it was this just collection of <laughs> just bonker stuff like go find it on youtube just wacky stuff stuff that i'd never seen and just artistic as all get out i loved it um check it out i'll talk more maybe more about that another time when i talk about the max so i'm going to go through every one of these not right now but so this one's just about young blood but i'm going to go through <laughs> all these issues and talk about what effect they had on me at the time but this one i don't think any book in here other than young blood None of these books had the impact that the Max did. And then to round it out, um, eventually uh, Wetworks came out from uh, Portacio. And I think he had, you know, I think a lot of people know he had, he was going to like one of the original partners that was supposed to like launch this book when all the other ones came out. But he had like a family emergency and had to, you know, delay this for some time. And by the time, and I really liked his X-Men work um, and was really looking forward to this. But by the time this hit, I was already kind of like, getting done with them so i think this is the only issue that i have of wetworks um and I, and also i think the team books just didn't resonate with me that much honestly like 
like I liked Spawn and the Max <laughs> and Youngblood just because it's Liefeld. But all these team books, there's just too many. Like the Pit, you know, single character, but didn't really do a ton for me. But like all these, just too many teams. Too many characters, <laughs> too many teams, and too many crossovers, man. Just like, and I'll get into it like when I start talk, like reviewing the actual issue of Youngblood. But all these issues suffer from that, where it's like, instead of like, just developing the character. Now, I think these two here, like Spawn and, and Savage Dragon, probably, and the Max, probably did the best at just like, developing the characters a little better. <laughs> it's hard to even say that about any of these image comics. But these were by far and away the best written ones, because that's the problem, really. Like, these dudes were all the artists from Marvel, not the writers, and they came to these and, and you know, bless their, bless their hearts, <laughs> they tried to do... Some some people, like, um, the Max had, you know, like, a co-writer and stuff like that, and, and Youngblood did as well at, at points, but, like, these dudes just weren't writers at all. Like, they were just, they were just artists, and it just doesn't, it doesn't work right the way they tried to do it, I think, but still, <laughs> I did not care. This was just revolutionary stuff. I loved it. Still do. Um... Just, uh, it's just great stuff. Like, I understand how polarizing it is. And, and specifically, I understand how polarizing Liefeld's art is. But I was all in. I loved it. I uh, had every issue of X-Force. I had, you know, a lot of... I started collecting a little bit after he uh, started New Mut his run on New Mutants. And so I didn't have a lot of the New Mutants stuff. But I tracked down that stuff as much as I could. But, uh, but boy... His artwork. It's pretty legendary. Everybody knows. Everyone talks about the feet, but boy, like, I don't even, I don't care about whether or not he's drawing feet. There are lots of other problems, mostly with proportions and anatomy, obviously, um, and just consistency with, uh, like, one gun will be one size in one page, and the next it'll be something else. And that's, you know, whatever, I guess, but. And so here, as you can see here, this is one of the other main issues I'll get into. This is the other main problem with this book, is this flip book madness. What a bad idea for your first issue to do. Like, you want to, I guess, you know, the premise is that there's two, you know, Youngblood's a government-sponsored team of these, like, celebrity heroes. I wouldn't call them heroes, whatever, mutant people with powers. And there's two teams. One's like, you know, a foreign team, and one's like the home team here in the states. But uh, and so he, but he splits them up into these like different stories and does this flip book, and shh, it does not work. It, because it's like it's so scattered already. It's so like just like what's going on? None of the characters are developed, and then you just got so many characters on these two different teams, and you got to flip the book over. It's a train wreck. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's a beautiful train wreck. Like here, right here, one of those consistency things. Like, dude's got chrome arms. All right, here we go. Chrome arms. Doesn't have a chrome arm. That's just like trademark Liefeld, I guess. That's part of the fun. But, uh, you know, the flip books thing. Like, I read this, and I swear, I told a friend the other day, I learned more from, I learned more backstory from the trading card like, the back of the trading card gave me more insight into the workings of what was happening than the story did. That's a problem. But anyway, uh, I'll get into this, like, full force here in a second. So, the, the, the formation of image is something I've been really interested in, especially lately. I've watched, like, documentaries and stuff. And it always seemed like it was kind of always sold as, like, you know, Todd and, and Rob decidedly, you know, to heck with Marvel, you know, they, Marvel's literally selling t-shirts with, you know, their, the images that they're drawing, they're, and they're not seeing a dime of that money, like I was saying with the merchandising and stuff, and I mean, like, literally Marvel is telling them sometimes, like, what they can and can't draw and how to draw it and stuff, and they're just fed up, and it, it's kind of, it's been sold to me before as, like, they just decide, like, we're done, we're quitting all the books, and then we're going to form this company, but it seems like, from the research I've been doing lately, like, it's more nebulous than that. 
So like, I picked this up um, as a kid, like in uh, it's like towards the end of '91, and uh, this is Overstreet's comic book price update. <laughs> there were there were so many like. So this is kind of like, maybe like Overstreet's uh, answer to Wizard or something. So Overstreet, you know, usually publishes that thick price guide once a year. But I guess like times were so good at this point, they're just putting out a monthly uh, magazine. Um, I, I just picked, I literally just picked it up because Rob Liefeld on the cover interview with Rob. So <laughs> this hot new artist I was uh, super into. But, but so the interview in here, it's... Uh, so he's not left Marvel yet. So this is like the height of X-Force, essentially. Like X-Force 1, you know, sold crazy well. And the the uh, the interview starts just talking about Cable, talking about Deadpool, talking about, you know, Marvel stuff, and even, like, referencing his Deadpool stuff. And then it gets interesting. <laughs> I'll read some of it to you. Um, so the interviewer asks, Could you tell us a little about your upcoming project to be published by an independent? He says, yes, it's true. I'm doing an independent project outside of Marvel next year, and we'll see how it flies. It could be the biggest disaster ever. And uh, and I'll just say, oops, bad, exper bad experiment. But I want to reassure anyone who may be concerned. Sometimes you hear about a creator doing something else because they were disgruntled. That is absolutely not the case. It's just an experiment. Ha ha ha, chuckle. <laughs> experiment this guy it's something new to try and then he goes on to kind of like talk about um in the indie comics that he's that he's been into like he talks about um the rocketeer and some other stuff and he even talks about how like how awesome he thought it was seeing the rocketeer and in indie comic on the big screen so like he's already like hollywood minded i thought that was kind of interesting then he goes on to say this is the interesting part so this is pre-image. This is still, he's very much working for Marvel. And he was, like, originally. So originally, it he was going to do an indie book and keep doing X-Force. That was the plan. And that's the stuff that I don't, I think I knew some of that maybe, but I didn't really understand all of it. But that's the thing that's interesting to me now. So he goes on to say, There are actually several side projects I'm doing. I'm forming a company with a few of my friends. And then parentheses, well, actually, they're forming it. I'm just kind of coming in as one of the people that's going to do work for them. That's, <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's weird. I mean, I technically have heard that before because I read this in 1991. But that's, that's an interesting way for him to put it. He goes on to say, we're going to do a few titles. I will be involved in the writing, drawing, and inking. I've been working during my, my sparse free time on the weekends and I've already got some pretty nice stuff done when I put X-Force off in the mail and boy does that <laughs> does that date this so like back in the day pre-internet pre you know uploading your pages they would <laughs> literally have to mail their pages in that's just crazy to me he puts it in the mail just before I start the next issue I'll take a little time for myself and work on my own projects I'll give you a little uh, advice information on it the first book we're doing it's called Executioners so no like no x dash but like just executioners and that's what these guys originally were and if you're familiar with rob's work and uh young blood then you already know you know these guys show up eventually <laughs> so yes it has an x in it i guess it's just part of me to give you the concept behind it it's about five rebel mutants who come back from the future to our time kind of a terminator twist to it but it's something i've had in my head for a while I really, uh, I really let my imagination run wild on this. All right, so, <laughs> so what's interesting about there's a, there's quite a bit that's that's some good little interesting bits in there. So first of all, th I think this is the book because I've I've heard in other places like in Wizard, they've talked about like he was going to do, you know, this book, and then Marvel was like, if if you do this book, we're gonna take you off of X Force, and and that's. That's also something I, I'm still, like, trying to, to find clarity on that. Was he, like, was Rob fired from from X-Force? Because he was about to do this, this two-issue cable miniseries. And that series, you know, eventually was done. <laughs> and it was supposed to be, 
you know, Cable's uh, big origin story, and it wasn't that. I don't know. I wonder if that changed um, when Rob left or what. But uh, but it was eventually done by John Romita Jr. and uh, Blood and Metal. I think this is the miniseries that he was talking about that he was supposed to be doing. And he was going to do these these two issues of Cable along with X-Force. And, you know, wound up doing <laughs> neither, quitting both, or getting fired from both. I'm still unsure. But anyway, so... <laughs> so these Executioner guys... Marvel, I guess, threatens to sue him, so he he changes them. They eventually become the Berserkers, and then they wind up in the pages of Youngblood. And Youngblood, if you don't know... So Youngblood started... Originally, like when it first started, it was a pitch for Teen Titans, which was kind of crazy. Or at least part of it was. So the very first incarnation, there were these um, pinups that he did in Megaton Comics. And they, these ran... So Megaton Comics is the indie comic back in the day and and so like Rob did like some pinups and stuff showing young blood had had the name you know logo all that stuff and I think he even had like the pitch of you know these are <laughs> these are celebrity heroes because that's what that's what they would be in real life but the thing that's crazy is so that book never happened and for another thing I've been finding is um it sounded like he he was going to do that he was going to do young blood as a black and white indie but they just there wasn't enough interest. Like I saw this one thing that said that they had like a five thousand dollar, you know, they had to get at least five thousand orders for the printer because the printer had that you know that kind of threshold, and they couldn't get that. This is before X Force. This is like eighties. Like this is before Rob was Rob. So they couldn't even get like five thousand orders for that, and so it never happened. But he kept like rolling that idea, that name, and that concept. You know, he kept it in his back pocket. But, uh, <laughs> so then, you know, years go by, he has this executioner's idea, you know, he's huge now, he's Rob Liefeld, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm, he thinks he can do a book with an X, the dude's got an X on his thing, he thinks that's gonna fly, which is just, just crazy and ballsy and just the most Liefeld thing Liefeld could be doing at the time, and so... They say, you know, you do this, we're going to sue you. So he decides, I'll just jam these together, I guess. Some of this is conjecture, but I'm assuming he thought, I'll just roll those characters into this original idea I had. And that's when he, you know, starts talking to Todd, Todd McFarlane, and uh, they get the idea to, like, let's just leave. <laughs> that's what I'm assuming happened. But anyway, so some of these characters, so originally those, that young blood pinup, black and white stuff didn't have shaft and vogue those are the guys these guys and i think maybe Die Hard as well came from this um failed teen titans relaunch pitch from like 1987 it was going to be like uh marv wolfman was going to write it and rob was going to draw it and this was like after he had done hawk and dove so he'd done like some dc you know teen titans ish type stuff and so arsenal <laughs> it was the original character that this shaft turned into so so the original his original idea was to have, and maybe that's why he has red hair, I guess. So Shaft was going to be Arsenal, and um, so Vogue was going to be um, Duala Dent, with like the Joker's daughter. She was like on the Titans roster for a while. So that's why she has this kind of like weird, like almost a Harley Quinn type pattern, I guess. And I think Die Hard was some kind of like Star Labs android or something like that. But anyway, so that's kind of the origin of Youngblood. So he had it kicking around in his mind for, for years. And then, at some point, it turns into this, <laughs> for better or for worse. And, uh, and so, you know, they go to Malibu. You know, they, they start this image company. They don't know what they're doing. They go to Malibu Comics, which was an indie comic publisher, and they're, they're going to them for distribution. So, and this was a different time of distribution. Like, it's not just, uh, like, so right now it's pretty much a monopoly. It's, uh, it's Diamond Distributor. They, uh, they're pretty much the game. They're the only game in town. But uh, back then it was different. So anyway, but they needed a way to get to the sh distributors, and that's how why that's why this first issue, and I think only, maybe just the only, this might be the only Image comic that even has the Malibu Comics logo in it, I think. I'm not sure. It's definitely, I think, the only Youngblood that has that. So they use them for distribution. They, they figure it out pretty quickly. Like, hey, we don't, <laughs> we don't need these Malibu guys. It's not that hard. Once you get the relationships going, you could do it on your own. 
So Rob's on plots. He's the creator. Plots, pencils, inks. And the inks part is important because if you look at these later issues, <laughs> these later issues of Young Blood, where he's not inking himself, it's, it's, it is not as good. So that's still with this flip book. Bananas, man. All right, so here, welcome aboard, new inker, Danny Meeky. And Danny, you know, is his inker for a while. And, and you know, they're a good pair, but it's just not the same. It just doesn't have the crispness. It's still Liefeld. It's still, like, very close. It's just not, to me, it's just not as good. Some stuff, like this looks about right, but some of this other stuff, it doesn't, it just doesn't. <laughs> so funny to get that particular about like Liefeld like it's still just bonkers anatomy no matter what no matter who's inking it it's still gonna look crazy but like I can tell like it's just not as good as when he's inking himself I think he just puts he puts more into it he knows <laughs> he knows what he's doing he's he knows the Liefeld thing better than any inker is gonna be and then like later like when you get way into like more modern stuff he's not even being inked on some stuff i think this is an example of that where they're just taking his pencils this is after he returned to x-force with fabian too <laughs> and you would have thought this would have been a better book i'll talk about this at some point maybe if i do a, a video about x-force specifically i'll talk about this but boy this this series it was a. Uh, not very good. Kind of crazy. Not in a good way. <laughs> Deadpool shows up, Wolverine shows up, and uh, even The Thing shows up. But, uh, man, his new stuff, this new stuff, I mean, it's still Liefeld, whatever. But like I said, not inked. It just doesn't have the same, the same feel. Like, it has the same f basic feel, but it doesn't have the same... Uh, I don't know. I can't tell if it's like I grew up and changed. Like the art is definitely different. It's not just me, but like I don't. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I still grab it occasionally. Like if I could find stuff like this in the cheap bin, and it, and he does interiors, I'll I'll buy it all day long. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of the the origin of this book. That's how it came to be. <laughs> and then, so the book comes out. It's huge has these cards. I don't, you know, the X-Force book came with cards and maybe he was like, you know, clearly that's a thing to do. But uh, I can't imagine people were like, oh, I've got to buy multiple copies just to get some, you know, a copy that I can cut the cards out and whatever. Maybe they did. I don't know. Okay. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's talk about the story. You open it up. You have to deal with this flappy card get it out of the way <clears throat> so it starts so the premise the problem <laughs> one of the problems the premise of the book is there's this you know there's two teams this young blood team and uh there are these heroes sponsored by the government or ran by the government whatever um and they're like the celebrities of the time they have pr agents that was the premise, which is, you know, that sounds like you could do something interesting with that. This book <laughs> doesn't, doesn't barely even touch on that. Like, the premise that we kept hearing, it's not here, man. <laughs> but what is here kills a dude with a pen. All right, starts in Washington. We got our, our boy here. He's our hero. You'd think the hero would get the big shot here, but no, his uh, lady friend does. Alright, so like, they're at the mall. Dude, uh, our, our boy Shaft, <laughs> he, he uh, sees some danger, takes him down. He's like, nope, I'm not the real danger. This guy, I don't understand what he's doing with this gun. Like, what's this hand doing? Like he's, like he's got a uh, like a shutter release for a oh like a camera. I don't know. Anyway, he's like this guy's gonna sniper me. Nope, I got an ink pen. 
I don't recall if I thought that was cool or not. I probably did. Let's say I did. Um, he's dead. Just straight up pen death. <laughs> what a way. What a way to start this. And so I guess like this aspect of it, like the media is like, oh, Shaft, uh, you killed that guy. I mean, I, that's barely like touching on that premise. Then you got, you got old Bad Rock here, which eventually, uh, or no, it was Bedrock. Bedrock first, and then had to had to be Bad Rock so that he didn't get sued by the Flintstones guys. And then you got, Di you know, he's like a kid. <laughs> he's like the thing, but he's a kid. I don't know. Man, the problem with all this is like, all these characters are just like kind of versions of other things. That goes, that's for the, the whole image launch <laughs> line was like that though. So you got Die Hard, he's like a robot. Um, <laughs> Captain America robot, I guess. Iron Man, ro Captain America combo. We got Shaft, he's a ladies man. He puts a skull on his face. He killed Spawn, he's ready for business. Look at this, this gun, it's ready to go. And you got Vogue. I, don't, I literally know nothing about Vogue. Like, this is her card. Maybe this will shed some light. Okay, she's a Russian defector, so she's like the Black Widow, I guess. Um, KGB, martial arts. <laughs> I mean, she's the Black Widow, but looks like, uh, looks like, uh, the old school Harlequin, I guess. Joker's daughter. They team up. I don't remember much about this guy. He's an alien, I guess. I don't know his name at all. What's his name? He's not here. No wonder I don't remember him. Who is that guy? Is he on the other team? Yeah, he's on the other team. What's he doing here? You're not supposed to be until after the flip, bro. Um, I don't know. They're, uh, they're alerted to some danger. These guys are breaking out. This wackadoo helicopter <laughs> is, is, I guess it's a media helicopter is covering this. They're breaking out these guys. Here's Wolverine. Here's you know, someone who could have been an X-Force bad guy at any moment. <laughs> Here he goes, hitting this guy with his crotch? He hit him with his legs and then the legs went back? Or it did hit him with the crotch? I'm not sure. This is not bad. Like, this is some life. This is pure life, though. This I'm not even going to make fun of. This is, this is on point right here. <clears throat> also, I'm not going to make fun of this either. Like, this, this you get that, like... I expect this. I want this. Let me talk a little bit about the coloring for a second. Because, like, this definitely looks digital. And I I guess it definitely is all digital. And that's a thing that I remember that, especially with, uh, with Spawn. Like, I don't have Spawn with me. You know what Spawn looks like. I just remember the coloring sticking out to me a lot. Um, it just did not look... You know, it didn't look like the normal Marvel stuff because it's... I don't think Marvel had gone digital coloring yet. I think they were still doing the... Uh, those crazy, the old school method where <laughs> you had to do that thing where each color had to be like uh, those Doc Martin dyes or whatever. I don't even know how all that worked. Thankfully, I never had to find that out. <clears throat> so, you, you're, you, you're, you barely get a taste of what's going on here. You get this splash page and you're like ready. Like, yeah, let's do the, what? <laughs> That's all I get? Just dipping my toe and then you gotta flip it. Now like flip books were a thing. I don't think they were ever a good thing. <clears throat> I think they're just like weird and confusing. I don't, I don't get the point. I don't get the photon. That's that guy. I don't get the uh, the benefit of the flip book. Like some things, like if it was like two different artists and they were teaming up on a book, like an indie comic or something, I don't know, maybe. But this, so now we're like dealing with, you know, this is the early 90s, dealing with Middle East, uh, Saddam Hussein wannabe. His name is Hassan Hussein. Well, well played. I'm not sure who's responsible for that, Rob or, or uh, Hank, but uh, this is the worst. <laughs> no, thank you. So this is the away team. They deal with foreign matters, I guess, while the other guys deal with, uh, you know, homegrown problems, domestic stuff. So these guys are uh, going, going to the Middle East. They're going to fix these, like, Hydra agents. What are these guys? 
I guess that's their support team. <laughs> and they're fighting these laser tag guys. All right. Um, so these, I don't know, like this guy's Cougar is interesting to me because, <laughs> not really, <laughs> Cougar has an interesting thing about him because if you look back, like the very first appearance of, uh, of this guy here, our boy Cable, his first appearance other than, you know, like before New Mutants was in like, uh, it's like Marvel Age or something, but uh, it just showed like Strife, Cable, like these early like design sketches and then it had cougar as well like not exactly straight up this cougar but like pretty close so like i always wondered like how did that work did like marvel own him did he have to like ask permission for that like what's the deal or was it just like oh it's just a sketch so it doesn't matter but like he names him cougar in that marvel age thing and then he just uses him i don't know i don't know if there was a like <laughs> it's such a minute like irrelevant thing but i really want some answers on that i always have so the fight continues they uh they wipe these guys out doesn't really matter not super interesting um <laughs> big alien guy fights too this guy <laughs> what's his name uh sci-fire oh that is not a good name um you know he finds the saddam hussein guy and <laughs> just blows his it blows his head up i mean you know that thing where people were like you know complaining about the violence and stuff in the 90s like al gore's wife or whatever was talking about video games and violence and stuff like <laughs> maybe she was right no not really but oh my gosh just blowing this guy's head up and that's it and they're like, oh, you weren't supposed to do that. Call in the cleanup crew. Oh, well. Yeah, these are the uh, <laughs> heroes. Next generation of heroes. All right, man. Um, that's it. That's the end of the issue. Uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, not a lot of backstory in here. Don't really understand what's going on. So issue zero comes out and it, you know, explains a little bit more. And it shows this is the Battlestone guy from Brigade. Like, what happened to him before before uh, Shaft comes in and leads the team. And Man, so this is like, the whole, this isn't even like penciled by Liefeld throughout. It's like some of it's Liefeld, some of it's not. And man, it makes a huge difference. Just the stuff that's not Liefeld, no thank you. But anyway, that kind of fills in some of the gaps, I guess. But uh, not really. So then like issue two drops. <laughs> And uh, that's when th these guys find these these guys show up. So the dudes from his executioners, you know, indie comic that Marvel wouldn't allow. They're now the Berserkers, and they have this Jack Kirby character. I'll give I'll give Liefeld credit on this. Like I when I was young and reading, you know, loving this stuff, Kirby just seemed like you know his older stuff, like his early Captain America stuff, like that's Grandpa comics. And then his like later stuff, like. I just wasn't into it, didn't understand it, but like, anytime I would read interviews with, with Liefeld or other of the Image guys, they would talk about Kirby so much, and then, uh, I mean, it eventually, like, maybe got me to check it out, I don't know, but I love Kirby now. I'm just so glad that, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure the first things I ever heard about Kirby <laughs> was Liefeld talking about him, which is crazy. So then we finally get to, like, the actual villain, like, the stuff this this stuff didn't matter at all there's this alien bad guy had like dark claw i don't know boy it doesn't really matter or add up to much prophet comes in that stuff's not super interesting i don't know i don't go into it all but like it's just they fight prophet and then they start fighting the aliens and then the berserker guys show up issue three still doing this flip book junk i'm not even gonna so the other thing was like they just started like using these few pages of young blood to introduce shadow hawk introduce supreme it's like man i ain't got time for this just give me the story i don't even understand what the story is but can i just have it again you know just not much happens you don't understand what's going on there's this this alien threat never made any real sense to me all right issue four 
we're finally done with the flip book. Thank you, Rob Liefeld. Um, oh, and unfortunately, finally done with the newsprint, too. Now it's like glossy paper and it looks like modern comics, which not as good to me, man. Um, I don't... I guess the stuff with profit still goes on. They finally... They finally face this alien bad guy that they've been working towards, I guess, since the first issue. So, and this is the crazy thing. So I saw this, and it said, Concluded in Brigade 4. All this stuff going on Young Blood, finally, like, oh, it's finally going to conclude in Brigade. And I, I was like, man, do I even have Brigade 4? Did I ever even finish this? And then I realized I do have Brigade 4 because it's a flip book <laughs> with Young Blood 5. Ugh. Why? What's happening here? So, the flip book part of this, the brigade part, is just, you know, just a bunch of non Liefeld brigade stuff. Who cares? So, all right, let's conclude this, this weird story. And then, <laughs> and then, it's Chap Yeep. Chap, I don't know how to pronounce this guy. Chap Yeep? Yeep? I always call him Chap Yeep. I don't know. But, uh, it's you're finally concluding the story and it's not Liefeld? Are you serious? I think I honestly think this might be why I stopped collecting comics. This issue, this storyline concluding with not Rob Liefeld's art. This is around the time I quit comics. Well, maybe I quit a little after this. <laughs> but still, that's it. I, I just that's uh that's infuriating. So then Young Blood 6. Thank you, no flip book. Alright. Liefeld's back. So I think this if you're gonna read Young Blood, maybe start here. I don't know, man. You got this cable guy. That's that's bonkers to me. Um I don't even remember anything about this. I'm just glad that, <laughs> that Liefeld's drawing it. I guess yeah, Mickey's inking it. But still like and here they're finally doing like the, some celebrity stuff. The way they're supposed to, you know, which was like the pitch for the book. But like, you know, I guess we've moved on from that alien junk. And now this is where Troll shows up. I don't know why that dude was popular. Anyways. Oh yeah, so this <laughs> this is crazy. So this this issue ends. This is that little, little, boy, little boy Rob Liefeld here. Talking about why it's taking him so long to get back to young blood. And then he proposes to his wife in the comic. How crazy is that? Um, so, you know, if you ever see this in a 50 cent bin, just know that, the, you know, check it out. This is where he proposes to his wife, I guess. Hopefully she said yes. I don't know. I guess she did. Anyway, that's about all the young blood issues I have. I have a few more here and there, but like when Liefeld wasn't drawing it, I wasn't buying it. So there's your young blood, for better or for worse. So as I'm sure it's clear by now, this book is just a mess. <laughs> so, but the crazy thing is, so like, you know, Rob had like a, that co-writer on this first issue, Hank, and uh, you know, he did no good, I guess. But like later on, like this book has several relaunches, like Alan Moore tries to relaunch it, Robert Kirkman tries to relaunch it, Joe Casey tries to relaunch it. None of those work. That's how convoluted and just and maybe that's the byproduct of like i said this was like three different ideas like trying to cram into one coherent thing and maybe maybe that's why this part or at least part of the reason this is such a train wreck like even those guys even those writers couldn't fix this into something coherent and interesting but uh yeah and they're still trying today like my friend chad is is writing a young blood book as we speak and i checked out the first issue it's you know it's interesting stuff but you know, Liefeld hasn't drawn it, so it's it's hard for me to get like super interested in anything Young Blood when when Liefeld's not drawing it. But you know, they're still trying to they're still trying to get this thing going. <laughs> it's just crazy to me. So 1991, the 50th anniversary of Marvel Comics, all their top artists leave soon after that. <laughs> what a celebration! You know, Image Comic happens, goes for like you know a few years. They're they're out selling DC. Like Image Comics is. It quickly becomes the second best-selling comic book company that in existence. It's crazy. Like they're outselling Batman, Superman, Marvel Comics is like <laughs> stocks plummet, all that stuff. And then, like 
about I think 1996, so like like four years after they started all this, after Image Comics has started, craziest thing happens. <laughs> Marvel Comics hires these guys to relaunch their titles with this Heroes Reborn stuff and paid them well to do it. So in one of those uh, documentaries I saw, Liefeld said that they paid <laughs> Rob and Jim Lee three million each to do these comics, to come back to Marvel and do these comics. What are you talking about? <laughs> three million a piece. And, and Portacio did it as well. I don't know if that dude got three million, but holy mackerel, that's just, that's insane. So these comics are, you know, <laughs> they're pretty much what you would think. It's Jeff Loeb on writing this too, uh, if that's something you're into. <laughs> these are all right. They're, it is what it is. They're, uh, Jim Lee on Fantastic Four is pretty interesting, um, but I just, I can't believe, this. it just seems like a different industry, like $3 million a piece. And another thing in those, uh, in that documentary, like Rob was saying that when Image was like at its height and getting crazy, all those crazy sales, he paid, Rob paid um, Stephen Platt, he bought Stephen Platt a sports car, a brand new sports car, just to leave Marvel, to leave Moon Knight and come draw profit. <laughs> What are you talking about? He bought him a sport like that. That's not the industry that I've that I know. It's just it was a different time. That's what I'm saying. Like if you if you didn't live through it, I don't know if you can fully grasp how absolutely crazy that was. So these image guys, you know, they catch they catch a lot of uh, a lot of complaints about you know they killed the the comic industry, the speculation stuff. You know, which the speculation stuff was happening anyways, with or without them, before them, after them, still going on. And yeah, I, you know, the lateness was a problem, the, uh, all that stuff. Like, them not drawing their books, <laughs> getting these other people to draw them, that was, that was the bigger problem to me. But, you know, for better or for worse, you know, they created Image Comics, which eventually, you know, got us so much, so much great comics over the years, so... You gotta give them some credit, and you gotta give them some crap as well. You know, it makes sense. The thing is, like, they were. I, I think about this a lot with like sports, you know, like football players or something. Like people complain about you know, these crazy things that they're doing, these antics they're up to. But like, they're kids. They're they're kids who are like instant millionaires. Of course, they're making crazy mistakes. Like that doesn't surprise me. Of course, that's what's happening, and that's what happened with these dudes. Like they, they formed these studios, and <laughs> it's just so crazy. They form Image. To get out from under, you know, like people telling them what to do and how to make their books, and then they start make these companies where they're telling people what to do. They're becoming the man. Um, you know, not all of them created studio like Larson and, and some of the other ones didn't create like the big studio things. But you know, it's just a lot of it's ironic, crazy. But you know, it was comics in the '90s. You know, it was it was what I wanted. It was for me. Like I said when I started, like, that's why I love this stuff. Because it was comics made for me, um, for better or for worse. <laughs> so, I'm going to be doing more of these. Uh, Spawn is up next. Um, I, You know, they probably won't be as long as this because I had to, like, lay out, the, you know, some of this history of, of uh, image and stuff. And this one to, to make sure you properly understood the rock star status and madness that these dudes had in in my life and in the 90s comics world. So anyway, there we are. <laughs> Image Comics, Young Blood number one. So thanks for checking this out. Um, let me know in the comments or uh, hit me up on Twitter. Let me know, you know, what you, uh, what Image meant to you, what Young Blood meant to you, um, if anything. <laughs> uh, you know, comment, like, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, share this on Twitter or whatever. That'll help. But thanks for, thanks for checking this out. I'll catch you next time.